Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Talking to Humans. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Ryan Reed. I'm the Client Services Manager here at BioNB. Uh, just to give you a quick background, uh, I've worked for three startups, uh, two in software and one in the health field. And I'm also on the side uh, an instructor in the MBA program up at the University of New Brunswick and I actually teach a course on market opportunity analysis, market validation. So today's uh, webinar topic is near and dear to my heart. Uh, a little bit about BioNB. Uh, we're a not-for-profit, not, not non-government agency and we were established in 1996, so 20 years ago. Uh, we changed our name to BioNB uh, three years ago, so you may recognize us as BioAtlantech. Uh, we are the Industry Association for Bioscience uh, in New Brunswick, and we support researchers and entrepreneurs in developing businesses. Uh, and we advocate for the sector. Our goal is to raise its profile. And currently, we're working with about 40 startups in bioscience here in the province. Uh, we have a staff of six, and we are based in, in Fredericton, but we also have an office in Edmonston. So thanks for joining us today. Um, quick uh, housekeeping items. Uh, I'm going to do the presentation probably 20 minutes, and then we'll uh, have time for some Q&A. And I'm going to give you my email address and my phone number so you can follow up after uh, the presentation if you have any questions. You can submit your questions at any time, and uh, Jenny will uh, collect them, and she will uh, she will ask them uh, of me at the end of the presentation. So you can submit those at any time by just going to the questions tab on the uh, panel to the right on the right side of your screen. Don't worry about taking notes; just sit back and relax. I'm going to email you uh, probably tomorrow. Copy the slides along with a video. Uh, version on YouTube of the uh, webinar. We're recording this webinar. We also have a bunch of other webinars. Uh, we have about a dozen webinars we've done over the last couple of years and they're posted up on our website and the link is there, bionb.org slash webinars. So we'll get started. Uh, this uh, webinar is called Talking to Humans and it's based on the book by a fellow named Gift Constable. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, lean startup books uh, like uh, The Lean Startup and Four Steps to the Epiphany uh, by Eric, Eric Rees and Steve Blanks. Uh, Talking to Humans is actually a really nice book. It's 65 pages. It's a really easy read, really well written, and it's about customer discovery. It's about market validation, and uh, GIF's kind of a leader in this area, and this is a book that I came across just over a year ago. And we use it here at BioNB with our clients. And I use it in my uh, course that I teach in the MBA program. Uh, it's one of the uh, one of the uh, books on the curriculum and the syllabus. Uh, just a little bit of background on GIF. Uh, he uh, he's been involved in six startups. Uh, he's uh, a, a get his reputation as a blogger and then he ended up writing the uh, book Talking to Humans. He also, we both I guess share the same fashion sense because we both have red button down shirts. I don't know if you noticed my picture when I showed my bio, it's the same. Uh, he wrote this book two years ago and he uh, collaborated with Frank Rimalski at NYU uh, and he's, his website is giveconstable.com and just kind of neat little uh, tidbit is that uh, Jenny had posted this on our social, uh, our Twitter feed and uh, if retweeted it. So he's aware, I don't know, he's probably not listening in, but he's aware of of this webinar, which is kind of cool. What we're doing up here in New Brunswick. So that's kind of neat. So uh, most of our clients are bioscience, and that's what the focus of my conversation is going to be about today, but the stuff I'm going to talk about affects all businesses, all, all entrepreneurial activity in any, any sector, any kind of business. Uh, you need to, f to think about the customers. That's the definition of a business. It's getting and keeping customers. Uh, this cartoon here, you may be laughing, uh, but this is the truth, especially in science. Uh, we work with a lot of researchers, and the ideas we see, the technologies are fantastic. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not an idea person. My background's in, in business, uh, and I'm just amazed by the uh, by the neat. Uh, innovative, truly innovative ideas that 
are being worked on in this province and across the country and across the world. Uh, but people are working on some really cool stuff. Uh, where there's a little bit of a downfall is when people focus too much on that idea, and I think it's human nature to think if you have a really good idea, what you think of a really good idea, everyone else will share that belief. And that may be true in that they think it's a cool idea, but whether people uh, are going to spend money on it, whether it solves a real market problem, is a whole other kettle of fish. Uh, and people who tend to uh, be really good at research and development and ideas people, uh, tend not tend to miss that commercialization aspect. Not everyone. It's very rare that you get this, the Bill Gates type person who's got the science background and that uh, business streak in them as well. Uh, it's not to say that uh, people don't have strong uh, business understanding, but the focus tends to lie on one side or the other, which is what we find. So ideas is a great start, but Customers, if you're going to be commercializing something, you've got to think about customers. You put the idea aside. So that's what we're going to talk about today because we're focused on commercialization. So uh, traditionally, and I, you know, I went to I went to business school almost 20 years ago, and you know, we focused on uh, uh, you know the Jupiter Research, uh, Forrester, Frost and Sullivan, all these. Uh, this is before Google, but nowadays Googling, doing secondary research and deciding if there's a, a market for a product or service based on some desk research. Uh, and this is a famous quote from Guy Kawasaki, who's a startup guru, uh, was involved in Apple back in the 80s. And this quote, it's funny, but it's true. Uh, that uh, this is how I, you know, I learned how to do market validation back in the day. Is you just find a big market, and you do some arithmetic, and you know how he says, how hard can it be to sell uh, one percent of that market? Uh, the the answer is actually it's really, really, really hard to do that. This is actually based probably on Pets.com, uh, which is a really good case study and what not to do. They made a lot of assumptions, and uh, I think they ended up. Investing 200 million dollars, the various investors invested 200 million in uh, shipping dog food uh, through the mail, which in 1999 the business model just didn't work. So, and they never that the it's an interesting case study that Steve Blank uses in one of his books, and that they never talked to customers until after they built their warehouse, uh, bought all their inventory, built their website, then went to market and realized people didn't want to buy dog food uh, through mail order. Uh, things are a little bit different today with Amazon shipping stuff all over the world, but back then it was a, a very different uh, business model. And, and and if they had sat down and talked to people in advance, they would have uh, probably done things a lot differently and saved a lot of money. I don't want to say I don't want to come across that I'm uh, poo-pooing uh, desk research. I think it's really important to scope out the market, to have an understanding of the industry and understanding of the market. The problem is people tend to rely on this and make bets based on secondary research. You don't want to do that. You want to get an understanding. And if you're in an innovative area, if you're trying to figure out a new business model, you're not going to find a research report. That's what Guy's talking about here is, yeah, one and a half million cans is not a lot, but is there a market there for that? You've got to dig and find it if there's actually a slice of that market that big market there, 150 million cans per day, total addressable market, is there a space for you? So the way to find that out is by, by talking to people. And the phrase is, you may have heard this, get out of the building. Uh, that's kind of one of the mantras of the lean startup movement. And uh, we have to just understand that we're making assumptions at the start about a business, a new business idea. So we're making assumptions and we need to test these assumptions. Uh, we're going to talk in a moment about specifically what assumptions we want to look at. And you can't do this in a conference room or by relying on secondary research reports. We, I've been in rooms where we, five people in the room are debating who the customer is and you're just debating amongst yourself the, re the realities you need to get up walk out of that room and go start talking to people. People will argue and waste hours and hours trying to determine who the customer is. <laughs> it's not, this isn't a, a, sem a university seminar. 
This is a business. You need to get out into the market. And as I said before, you can't rely on those secondary research reports. They're part of it, uh, but they you can't rely on what you read in a, in a Forrester or Jupiter research report. Uh, and you need to get out into the market to learn. And the best insights come from observing real behavior and talking to real people. And this doesn't mean that you're not going to be doing some uh, qua quantitative research, surveying, focus groups, that kind of stuff down the road. But at the early stages, when you're trying to decide if the business model and the, this innovative idea is going to have any traction in the market, the best way to do it is to go out and start talking to people because your assumptions are probably all wrong at this stage and you'll probably change them fairly quickly. And I'm going to talk about a case study of real situation with four businesses in my MBA class. So the uh, this field, uh, the name for it in the lean startup world is called customer discovery. Uh, and it's about having these conversations. So it's not focus groups, it's not survey monkey surveys, it's talking to people. So it's not about compiling statistically valid data, not at this point. I've been involved in those kind of surveys and where you're getting 500 or 1,000 people intercept surveys, and they have the, their place depending on the kind of business and the stage. But when we're trying to figure out if there's a market and who that customer is, uh, this isn't the place yet. Your job is to learn. You're not there to sell. And uh, my students learned this distinction the hard way, but it made their lives a lot easier when they realized they were just a detective. They were just going out to investigate, find out some things. They weren't trying to go and push a product. It made things a lot easier for them. People love to talk. Uh, uh, but just asking people that you're looking uh, for information, you're not selling anything. People love to help. Uh, and the interviews that I've done for various businesses, they have learned so much. I'm going to talk about how, what our students went through or my students went through. Uh, they were a little bit hesitant at first, but they found even talking to parents in a lineup at the movie theater at the mall here in Fredericton, people would talk. People would talk. You just have to ask them. And it's about having conversations. It's not an interrogation. So we'll jump into uh, five steps, five or six steps here. And the book, the, this webinar is designed to give you a real quick overview of the book. Then you're going to go and read the book. It's a really easy read. It takes about 45 minutes. Uh, so I just want to capture some of the highlights here because I think this is a really important book and it's really helpful and really useful. So that's why we wanted to do this webinar. So uh, who you're going to interview, you want to you want to focus on the customers. I know that may sound obvious, but I'll explain what that why I mean by that in a moment. But you're looking for people who are probably going to buy, and you're going to make an assumption about who that might be at the beginning, and it'll probably change, and that's okay. But you're trying to identify people that have the problem you're trying to solve. So you're trying to think about, I have a product. What problem is it solving for a customer? So you want to identify who those people are. And when you're doing these initial interviews, you want to zoom in on the early adopter and the person who's looking for a solution at the moment. Uh, the phrase is it's someone as crazy as you are uh, that at this point in time they uh, they see the value in what you're doing. Human nature is such that people don't like change. So if you're working on something new and innovative, you've got to get those crazy people on your side. And once those crazy people join you, the regular uh, conservative folk will join on. But you have to start it with that early adopter. So identifying who those people are is really key. And GIF talks about this in more detail, of course, in the book. You can also look at uh, potential partners, so distributors and suppliers, and domain experts. We often have our, our clients first go out and talk to people who've worked in the industry uh, who have a really good understanding of the uh, market and the market mechanisms, and they can give them a really good overview at first, but at the end of the day, they're not necessarily a customer, and that's all that matters. Customers are all that matters, people who pay you money. Otherwise, it's just a research project. So if you're looking to do a business, Got to start talking to customers, but it's okay to start with partners and domain experts in the early part of this process to get that mix. So GIF actually uses a 
example of an on-call veterinarian service in, <laughs> in the book. Uh, and he uh, uses a couple examples, that's one of them, because he's trying to think, get away from IT. This is, can be used in any, any field. And your typical customer, so for an on-call veterinary service, so that's your phone that that comes to you. They identify the typical customer. This is the assumption. Pet owners living in remote areas or busy professionals. One of my argument might just be wealthy people don't want to leave the house. So uh, you, that's who you start with. And you might find that's right, or you might find that they have no reception, uh, receptiveness to what you're, what you're trying to do. So you want to start out with those assumptions. So, what's an assumption? I just wanted to put the definition there uh, of what an assumption is. It's accepted as true or certain to happen without proof. So it's, assumptions are great. It's a tool you need to use in science and business to get things done. You just have to keep in mind that you've got to prove those assumptions at some point. I always say it's okay to make these up at first because that's really what you're doing. You might have a product, a service, a new technology, and you're thinking the customer's going to be this. You're really just making that up. It's just coming out of your brain. It doesn't mean it's right. It's just a hypothesis. For the customer uh, validation, uh, or customer discovery, sorry, you want to pick the riskiest and most uncertain assumptions. There's about four to six of those. And you'll develop a list of questions that you'll use to help you just prove or disprove these assumptions. And these are the 12 assumptions Gift Constable lays out in his book. So, my who will my target customer be? So you you just describe who that person is, and we use the example of the on-call veterinary service that it's uh, somebody who lives in a out in a far rural area, and then they want to come in into the city, or it's a busy professional. The problem that uh, that customer wants you to solve is what is this? What is that customer struggling with? And the focus really on all of this comes down to that. Is there a problem that needs solving by somebody? And my customer's need can be solved with this is the actual product piece, product or service. So it's just one of the assumptions. You're assuming that your product will solve that problem. But if we put the problem first, uh, you might find that your product or service may have to change depending on what the problem is. That's why you can't uh, develop something in isolation, a new technology, and think, shoehorn it into the market. You may have to change it. So you're making an assumption that your product is going to solve a problem. Uh, why can't my customer solve this problem today? So these are some obstacles, getting them in the way. It might be time, money, uh, lack of availability. The measurable outcome my customer wants to achieve and this is you're trying to under, uh, measure if you can measure the change that uh, happens uh, from uh, them adopting your product or service. For example, saving time, saving money. Uh, your primary acquisition tactic for, for capturing customers, you've got to figure out what your marketing channel is. And people tend to say, well, I'll use social media. Well, that's not necessarily going to work for everything. Uh, and we find that a lot of people don't think a lot about the distribution channel, how they're actually going to sell at the go-to-market. It's kind of glossed over, but it's important to understand how people would actually purchase this and access it and then test that. Uh, you're going to have an assumption about who that earliest adopter will be as a subset of that target customer. And just back on that earliest adopter, it's more of a psycho psychographic profile. Uh, it's within a, within a section of a, a segment of a customer type, but there's a certain personality that's that early adopter that you want to try and identify. How you what your revenue model will be? Uh, you may assume that you're going to sell uh, this, uh, you know, uh, by uh, a one a one time purchase. When in fact uh, you might end up having to do a subscription. People prefer to do a subscription. A subscription service. We found this with one of our clients that the industry norm was to do leasing, not to buy. And that was interesting insight for them. You're making assumptions about who your competition is, and it's important to identify that your direct competitors, but also your indirect competitors. Uh, so if you're selling, uh, uh, example, is a movie theater that you know the indirect competitor could be 
uh, restaurants and bars, all the things that people can do in their leisure time rather than go to the movie theater. The other thing to consider that a lot of people uh, don't is uh, status quo, so what people are currently doing. People hate change, so sometimes they'd rather just keep doing what they're doing rather than move to a new, a new product. Uh, you're making an assumption about what your competitive advantage is. Uh, again, you're at first you're making that up. You might be right, but you probably aren't, so you want to test that. Uh, your biggest risk to financial viability is uh, you may have really high fixed costs. You may have to borrow lots of money. There's all kinds of uh, reasons that uh, uh, that you could uh, not get to break even, uh, and you want to identify those and de-risk them. And if you have a product or uh, technology, you want to you want to identify what the biggest uh, technical or engineering risk is. You know, if you're building a, if you're Boeing and you're building a, a plane, or you're uh, uh, Elon Musk launching uh, spaceships, there's a fair bit of technical risk. So you want to identify and uh, confirm uh, what those are so that you can deal with them. So those are the assumptions, and GIF goes into detail in the book about about those. I, uh, we work with scientists for the most part, and we always tell them about the scientific method, which they know about better than me. But once they see that what we're doing is just the scientific method, we're just making some observations, we're throwing out some hypotheses, and now we're going to go test them with experiments or with discussion and observation. So then they start to understand, okay, we're just going to do the scientific method, here, which they're, they're used to doing, and we find that they jump onto this right away. Uh, because that's how they're they're used to working. It's typically the MBA people, the business people who don't get this stuff. You have to you have to really explain it to them. So uh, part three is you got to go find some subjects for your uh, interviews. One degree of separation means don't ask your friends and family because they'll just tell you what you want to hear, and that's not good to you. I want to get creative in trying to find people. At least to start, it's hard to get started. We'll talk about that in a moment. You're work, looking at your target market and early adopter customers. Your pitch for the meeting is that you're asking for advice. You're not selling anything, and it's okay to actually literally say, we're not selling anything. I just need your advice, and you pay for the coffee. Ask them for referrals to other people, and they will give them to you. Start with a few names. We usually give our clients a few names, and then it builds into a list of 10, 20, 30, or more. Uh, people tend to run with this. In terms of getting creative, the starting points are industry associations. Uh, LinkedIn is a good way, way to search for people. Uh, you can build a landing page. He goes into detail in the book where you could uh, canvas people for, if they're interested in a certain technology, they could put their email address in and you could capture names that way. One thing I've done is look at bloggers in the field and reach out to them. Some people put ads on Kijiji or Craigslist to find people in an industry they could talk to. And my students actually use this one that GIF recommended is wherever there's a line of bored people, just go and walk up to them and you've got a captive audience. Now, of course, it depends on what your uh, product is. In the case of the students in my class who did this, they were actually looking for parents uh, for, for two projects. So that there were a fair number of parents lined up in a lineup going into a, a matinee kids movie so they're pretty uh, smart at uh, identifying that being creative about finding those subjects now quickly on how to interview uh, this is a conversation it's not an interrogation or survey or a formal interview uh, you're not you you're going to write out a list of questions just so you have a guideline but you probably will throw that list out and not go through it one by one so that's what I mean by not being an interview you don't go through every question right after the other you it's kind of like an interviewer on a on CBC radio if if you're uh, the person you're interviewing is on an interesting topic you're gonna let them keep talking about that so you want to get them to tell a story uh, you don't ask them about right but would you buy this product no that's not the way to approach it you want to understand the problem they're facing so I always give the example as if you're uh, working in a business and you're tracking all your sales contacts and usually you start out by using Excel and it becomes a disaster at a certain point. You're looking for a software tool. Uh, Salesforce is really expensive, so you know what do you do to 
to find a tool that can help you. So there's a good example of a company that went in and understood how small businesses transitioned from using spreadsheets to getting a CRM uh, and understanding their their problem that they faced. And one of those problems with price that the Oracles and the SAPs and Salesforce tend to be expensive. You want to use open-ended questions and the trick is to use ones that start with who, what, why, and how. And your questions, as I mentioned, are just a guide to get you going. You really should do these in person or via Skype or FaceTime so that you can see facial expressions and have that relationship. Not by email and not uh, by phone. Again, you want that facial expressions. And you want to do one person at a time. It's not a focus group because you don't want to worry about uh, uh, a group thing or somebody dominating the conversation. It's okay if you and a scribe, the two of you, go and interview one person, but you want to interview one customer at a time. And this is uh, out of the book here is a uh, gifts one of gifts examples for question set used for the uh, his on call veterinary service. So he's got to warm up, and they they ask them about their current vet and how they found that vet and why did they choose that vet and tell me about the last time you took the took the pet to the vet because they don't understand what what the person's going through what they what you know if they go to the vet what resonates with them uh, and what they're trying to find out what was frustrating about going to the vet so they're trying to understand that whole problem around getting that appointment to get your pet seen they're not jumping into, will you use my on-call veterinary service? No, that's not what they want to do at this point. They want to understand what problems people are facing because they might not need an on-call veterinary service. They might need something else. So once you've gathered information, you want to, you want to of course, capture them with detailed notes. You want to share and discuss within your team. You want to look for patterns. Uh, you're not looking for statistically valid information at this time. It's nice to have some uh, metrics. So, for example, usually people think if they get a positive signal, like, oh, everyone we talked to said that they would, this is totally a problem. Well, maybe we'll quantify that somehow, just really roughly on the back of an envelope. Well, only 70% of the people we talked to actually said it was a real problem for them. So that that's different than that anecdotal uh, evidence. And being aware of false positives and false negatives, you know, don't uh, build your business around five interviews. Uh, you're trying to get some patterns here and some insights. You're not trying to necessarily make your final decision on what you're going to do. And the, the fewer number of people who you talk to, the greater the chance of the false positive or false negative. You might just be talking to negative people. They're against everything. So how many to talk to? Everybody always asks this question. Depends on the product, the service, the customer, the industry. There's all kinds of variables. But rule of thumb, if you're in business to business, 25 interviews. Business to consumer, 100. I would say the B2C is faster because you're probably looking at 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, where the B2B, you're looking at in-depth conversations, trying to understand an industry and how a big company might buy something or an institution or government. It's a lot more complex. And the one takeaway is never stop talking to customers. A lot of big companies forget to do this until it's too late. So it never stops. Okay, so some tips. Being told your idea is cool. It's not useful. You want to actually ask people for brutal honesty. Some people say, Listen, I want you to be honest because I don't want to waste my time and money on this project. I don't want you to say it's awesome when it's not. So I want you to I want your honesty. Feedback from friends and families of little value, getting creative with finding interview candidates, looking for patterns, asking for advice. Literally ask for advice. And ask for referrals at the end of your interview. Who else can I talk to? This is a question Steve Blank always asks at his. He said, what did I forget to ask you? And this allows that interview subject to state all the things that were going through their head that uh, they didn't feel like they could say. 
and you want to focus on understanding the problem first. So that's when I was talking about earlier is that we're trying to uncover the problem that people are have, what are their day, their life. Um, you're not jumping in and saying, would you buy this product? Do you think this is a cool product? This is going to solve this problem. So you're focusing on the problem for first. That doesn't mean you won't be having those conversations down the road where you are going to be saying, do you think this is a good product? And actually these interviews, depending on who you talk to, they're usually done in batches of two or three where the first round is usually problem identification. Uh, the second is solution validation. So sh saying we built this product to address this problem, what do you think? And the third is that iteration because it'll iterate, that product will iterate. Uh, listen, focus on listening, not talking, let the other person talk. If you're in bioscience, you do have to consider IP issues. So you may not want to uh, talk about the technology in detail because that might lead to a disclosure problem for a patent. Uh, not, I don't want to alarm anybody and probably not going to steal your idea, but you don't want to give too much detail about the solution. So that's why the focus is on the problem and we say to our our clients, you're focusing on the problem so you're, you shouldn't be giving away your solution at this stage, you're doing it wrong. But for any of our clients, it's on a case-by-case -case business because every situation is different, but it's something to consider. It's different when you're doing something that the IP is not really a problem. And what we're seeing is customers expect you to have gone out and done this stuff. In the IT uh, community here in New Brunswick, it's fairly advanced. Everybody's talking about this stuff, customer validation, going out and talking, getting out of the building. It's new in uh, bioscience and other fields, but NBIF and VCs, they're all asking, who have you talked to? What validation do you have? And they don't want to see the market research reports. They want to see uh, this kind of uh, in, in, uh, intensive discussion with people. And uh, sometimes people say, well, like bioscience, you know, uh, it's not like an app. It's, you know, it takes a long time. It costs a lot of money. And this Toby Reed here is managed director at BioCity over in the UK. He's no relation to me. Uh, but he had a really good uh, quote out of a webinar I watched on uh, healthcare a validation. That's what BioCity focuses on. And he said it's even more important in bioscience that you do this uh, lean startup approach because of the timelines and the money. You don't want to waste your time. Uh, you don't want to waste 10 years developing a drug that doesn't really have a market or a, a med tech device or, or whatever. Uh, and for the wrong customer. So this is important to do this as early as you can. And like I said, there are some issues um, with uh, IP and some sensitivities around that. And that would, you know, you would discuss with your advisor, somebody like us. So uh, my MBA class, uh, there were four teams and they, I, I had them go out and do 10 interviews, which isn't a lot, but I had them do it over a three week period. They did do a guide of questions, but they found they threw out that uh, question sheet because they learned what they needed to ask. And they learned how to get the person to talk. And they found that natural conversation was best. They found that people love to talk to the point where sometimes people told them too much and even said, I think I've told you too much about a certain large companies, what was happening inside them and government, and that kind of stuff. So it's You'd be amazed what people will say if you shut your mouth. <laughs> they found that when one team found what they they sent an email to a bunch of people and said, we want to understand if you would buy this product. And they got zero response to that. And then I said, we'll try a different set of people and say, we're trying to understand this problem in this industry. And they ended up getting all their interviews out of that email. So it was just a different approach. But people don't want to talk about buying stuff. They do want to under talk about all their problems. They found that learning was deep. Our best class discussion all year was our, our uh, debrief after they were out in the field. Uh, they were energized by it. They learned so much versus the first half of the course where we focused on doing these traditional desk research. I would say out of the 12, on average, four or five of the assumptions changed completely. Uh, there were some pivots in strategy. Some of the assumptions they found were they're completely off base. And one business, they ended up shelving it. 
uh, and, and all these projects were consulting projects, so they were actually real entrepreneurs. The students were developing these market opportunity analyses for. And the, the team that did this one, uh, where they shelved the business, uh, they had been keeping them up to date throughout the course of the term. And, uh, you know, this information uh, that they've been collecting uh, had been shared with them over the time. And this last bit was the final nail in the coffin. And, and everybody was fine with that because they said, why, why would we have waste? There's, there was no market for the product they were developed. It was a cool product, but there was just no market for it. So everybody's moved on to do other things. And everybody's happy with that decision. So they're glad to have found that out. And the term the students use, which is a common one, is fail fast. It was a good example of, of failing fast. So the uh, book that GIF wrote is available at that link. Uh, there is a PDF you can download for free. There's an EPUB version you can use on iBooks. Uh, there's an Amazon version. Uh, that uh, is 99 cents. If you have a Kindle, you've got to pay 99 cents. But the other ones are free. And there is a print version you can order to. I think it's $10. Uh, so your homework, read the book. It takes about 45 minutes. It's actually a funny book. It's really neat. The cartoons in it are cool. Uh, it's written to be engaging and uh, you, you get a lot out of it. So if you're looking to bring a product to market, I really strongly suggest you read it. He's also got uh, 12 tips on his blog, which are a great summary. And if you're really into this, this is what I made my students watch. Steve Blank's Lean Launchpad customer discovery videos. Uh, there's about 20, you know, two or three minute videos. They're really comical. They show you what to do and what not to do uh, in these kind of interviews. And Steve's kind of a character too, so he's uh, really engaging to watch. And this is about 45 minutes, so you're looking at an hour and a half of your time, well, plus this webinar, so two hours to get this grounding. And this is what my students got. They, had, they read a couple other things, uh, but they got a lot out of it and were able to get it in the field. Uh, it's, this isn't a science, it's an art, and really valuable. For any of our uh, clients out there on the call, uh, we do the uh, assumptions exercise. We help you list out your 12 assumptions and put together a customer validation uh, plan. And we give you some contacts to get started. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, you've got to do the interviews. Only one thing I want to point out, and I didn't really cover this, is that you can't hire a consultant, even though my students were consultants. But that's that's a class. But the entrepreneur, the founder, CTO, they got to do this stuff because they're the only ones that can make the changes. If they get it from a third party, oftentimes people just say, bah, I don't believe you. So they need, to, they need to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. So that's a really important point. <coughs> so uh, I've got uh, to open it up to questions so you can send your questions in. And send, uh, Jenny's just been sending these to me. Uh, so uh, do you talk about price in your interview? Um, well, the thing you don't want to do, at least in your early interviews, is say, would you pay $100 for this product? People will say no, or they'll say, yeah, sure. And that's kind of meaningless to you. Uh, the trick is to ask them to get their credit card out and see if they actually do it. And some people, I've seen people do this. I think even Steve Blank uh, has, a, has a video on this where they ask the people to take out their credit card and people went, oh, uh, I don't know if I uh, can do that right now. So what you're trying to understand is that problem they're having and really get to the bottom of that and then ask them, you know, what, would, what does this cost you? And, and understand the price component of that problem and then how much they might pay to get rid of it completely, to have those kind of conversations rather than would you pay X dollars to solve this problem. <coughs> so you, and you want to be skeptical about whether they say, uh, I work for a company, one of the startups I work for, we, we asked people if they loved our, our product. Uh, we never actually asked them if they pay for it out of their pocket. But they said, it was the greatest, literally, somebody said it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, all these wonderful things about the tool, but 
when we went to market, nobody actually wanted to pay money for it. So that was a real learning for me. Uh, are focus groups still considered a valuable research tool, or is the comp concept completely out of vogue? Um, well, the lean startup people would say focus groups are garbage. Um, the, the problem with focus groups is it's the Procter & Gamble approach. Uh, and for it to be done properly, you need somebody who's actually trained in this area and uh, that's got the uh, the market research training. They might have a PhD even in this stuff to, to really properly do uh, focus groups because you've got this group dynamic. You've got group think. Uh, usually focus groups are used to for preferences based on products that people already know about. Um, so you have to be really careful about them. The problem you get into if you try it on your own, I've done this, is you get into groupthink, dominant people in the room win, uh, and you don't get all the uh, the uh, perspectives of all the people in the audience, the group. Uh, the, the customer discovery people really push, have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people because you're really trying to dig and understand uh, the problem they are having and you're trying to pull themes out. It's kind of like voting. That's Voting is effective because it's a secret ballot. If everybody had to vote in public, it'd be all different, different, uh, different situation. Um, uh, okay, regarding the issue about IP, is it appropriate to bring an, an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, uh, to these conversations? Um, you know, if you brought one to me, I'd say I'm not going to sign it. Uh, you're just trying to, you know, you're you're using this person's time. It's one thing to take an NDA to a a VC, and they, they won't even sign these things. And it's questionable uh, as to the uh, validity of them in any ways, but I think the issue that the person's asking about is the, I don't want to talk about my secret idea. If you want to keep it secret, it's probably never going to go to market, and you're focused on trying to understand the problem. Again, you're not trying to get into uh, what do you think of my innovative new solution to this uh, medical problem or whatever. So you're trying to understand the problem that they're having first. It's not to say you don't want to get this stuff protected, uh, but if you have a patent or uh, that kind of strategy in place, or if your tool is such that there's no way anybody could figure out how it uh, works sitting on the table in a coffee shop, uh, then you don't really have anything to worry about. Uh, the fact that you uh, are talking to customers, and understanding the problem, and who the potential customer might be, you're way farther ahead than most people who are developing uh, product in isolation. Uh, when choosing your Target interviewees, can you speak to competitors? Good idea or bad? Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's great to go and talk to competitors. People tend to to uh, share a lot of information. Uh, you know, again, you go back to you're trying to understand how the industry works. You're trying to understand the problems that customers have in the industry. So you're not necessarily going and saying, hey, what do you think of my <laughs> variation on a theme here? So it's, again, it's about that problem discovery versus that solution validation. You're probably not going to go validate your brand new wicked thing with uh, uh, your competitors, uh, but you're going to get a lot of insight from talking to competitors. That said, uh, your focus needs to be on uh, customers, potential customers, because they're the ones that are actually going to pay for it. So if you don't have a market for your uh, product or service, uh, you're not going to get anywhere. So uh, I hope that answers questions and uh, Jenny said that's it. That's all we've got for now. Um, my contact info is there and uh, by email you can uh, reach me at any time. I'm going to uh, send uh, the slides out and the uh, link to the video tomorrow. And I appreciate everybody for, for joining uh, this afternoon.
And uh, if you're a client, feel free to follow up if you're interested in doing the assumptions exercise uh, to get you to the next step. And thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Have a great afternoon.